All right, uh, we'll get started. And um, let's see. So the plan today is to cover most of our chapter eight. So we'll see how much we can uh, we can go. This is again the mean case. If you remember what we were talking about last week, we're trying to figure out if I have a numerical variable of interest, and I'm trying to learn about its mean, and how can we do a Bayesian inference uh, for for that process. Uh, so we motivated um, us of um, using the C example. So let me just come to this point. So we're trying to uh, use a normal model for this uh, log version of total expenditure from the consumer expenditure survey. And the goal is we are trying to learn about the average value, the mean or the mu of this um, numerical outcome variable. And we did the log transformation to make it a little bit easier to, to manage. So then we reviewed a little bit of what the normal distribution is. It has two parameters, uh, mu and sigma. Mu is the mean, sigma is the standard deviation. And then we came to the point where we are trying to um, review a little bit about the beta in the past, or I should say the general Bayesian inference procedure, the three steps. And then we reviewed how we did that for the beta um, binomial data likelihood, where we have a uh, beta for the prior binomial for the data model, and then a beta posterior. And then we sort of ended, I think, um, talking about how we can do that for, for the normal. And um, so this is pretty much where, where we are for the normal case. So to recap, we are trying to work out um, how to figure out prior distributions in this case. We have a data model as the yi, iid of normal. And then we have two parameters unknown in, in the normal model. And you're gonna see that we're gonna assume uh, one to be known, the other one to be unknown and trying to understand the unknown one. Uh, but for now, if we have both of them unknown, then what we are figuring out is we're gonna actually have a joint prior. So we generically write pi and include whatever the parameters you're working with in the pi. And then here, we're able to write out the likelihood function in terms of mu and sigma uh, as well. And then eventually uh, the base rule will help us derive a joint posterior. So if you have both unknown, this is uh, the generic uh, structure. And you will see that we're gonna assume one of them is unknown, the other one is known, and then we can work with one parameter at a time. But if you do have more than one parameters, uh, this is the general setup of how you can go. So you have a joint prior and then you have a joint posterior, just like in the past. If you have a prior for one parameter, you can uh, use base rule to figure out the posterior for that parameter. If you have two or three or more, or I don't know how many, um, there's always this general structure of how to do the Bayesian inference, prior, likelihood, and then the posterior. All right, so we're gonna start with how to figure out the case where only mu is unknown. So sigma, even though it is um, a parameter in the model, let's just say, sigma is known. So I try, like, I try to highlight all of the known quantities here in, with red. So you'll be able to know that we're not dealing with not knowing that value, um, but then mu itself is unknown. So with that, we call it this one parameter model, okay? So sigma is known, so we, don't, we won't worry about it, but it's still part of the model, so we'll keep writing it. And like I said, we're gonna assume that sigma is known, but then earlier, remember, when both of them are unknown, we have this likelihood function as um, the joint of mu and sigma, but now, because we only have one unknown parameter, we're only gonna write alpha mu, uh, alpha mu, even though sigma will still be in the form, but we are only caring about mu, so we're gonna write out the likely function as a function of the unknown parameter. Okay, so this is from the two parameter model to the one parameter model. So this is a simplified version, but working through it will give us some insight of how to work with two parameters later. So in that case, uh, remember, um, instead of writing the joint as mu and sigma for the pi, we're gonna write out a prior distribution for only the mu itself. And I just put sigma after the conditional sign to let us know that this is a known quantity. We don't have to worry about it. And similarly, when we write out the posterior, I write uh, sigma after the conditional sign as well. Okay, so this is really just trying to uh, remind us that this is the case where we uh, assume sigma is known, we're not gonna deal with any of it. So everything is about mu. So if you see it here, the prior is about mu, uh, the likelihood is about mu, and the posterior is about mu as well. 
So if we try to refresh our memory a little bit in the beta binomial case that we did before, this is pretty much what we had done, right? We had a prior for P and then we express the likelihood in terms of P and then we're able to get the posterior in terms of P. It was natural over there because P is the only parameter back then. So this is what we had before. And uh, for the normal, as I told you before, mu and sigma both could be unknown. So you always have those two terms in your overall write-up. But if we only assume that sigma is unknown and uh, sigma is known and mu is unknown, then everything is only about mu itself. That's why you have a pi mu. You're gonna have an L mu, and then eventually you're gonna have a pi mu given the data and the sigma. So you might be wondering, why do I keep the sigma everywhere? Uh, this is again, really just try to remind us that sigma now is after the conditional sign. So we assume it is known no matter what. And it's also gonna be useful because as, we, as soon as we start to do the derivation, you will see sigma everywhere, okay? Because sigma is part of the likelihood function, right? So when you write out the joint normal, like in one of the homework exercises that you did before, you're gonna have sigma. And you might get confused about what sigma is doing over here and all that. So in, um, for, for the ease of that, I'm keeping sigma in red in the highlight and then put it after the conditional sign to remind us that we don't need to worry about sigma because it's known, but it's still part of the likelihood function. So you will see it as you're deriving it. Okay, so keep that in mind. I will keep um, reminding us as we go through the process and all that. And today, I think uh, part of the lecture will be mostly um, about doing the uh, derivation exercise and everything. And I'm just uh, just mute everybody uh, like uh, remote, but if you need to speak up, please uh, just speak up directly. Maybe you are trying to unmute it, but if you don't, just, just go ahead. Sorry about that, just to get the um, voice audio better. All right, so how can we give a prior from you? And we're actually gonna work with the conjugate prior. So if you remember the concept of conjugate prior in the past, we have beta for as the prior for P and we have a binomial data likelihood. And then we call beta as a conjugate prior in that case, because your posterior is another beta. Okay. So the concept of conjugate prior is that you start with a um, distribution family for a particular parameter. You combine with your data or likelihood and you arrive at a different prior a posterior distribution, but it's coming from the same family. So that means if we start with the beta for the success probability P, we have a theta posterior because beta is conjugate. And what I'm telling you now is, well, if I'm only working with mu as unknown, I only think mu is the a parameter in my normal model, then if I give mu a normal prior, I'm gonna go arrive at a normal posterior. Okay, so this is what conjugate means. Uh, but I do want to highlight because in this case, there are two normal distributions going out. So it can be a little bit confusing. So let's talk it through one by one. The sampling density doesn't change. Okay, so sampling density, no matter what kind of prior that you give, um, you always have the sequence of observations identically and independently distributed according to a normal distribution. Okay, so this is, well, you will get the practice one more time of writing out the joint density of a sampling uh, of Y1 through Yn. And eventually you're gonna write it out in terms of mu. So that's the normal part. So the first normal distribution is about the data model, okay? So here, everything is about the y1 through yn and mu and sigma, they're the mean and standard deviation of the likelihood function. The other normal distribution is the prior, okay? So what I'm claiming over here, as you can see in the title and all that, is, well, if now I assume mu is unknown, I'm actually trying to do my Bayesian inference, I'm gonna give it a normal prior distribution. So here, the normal is about mu. Okay. So it has its own mean, mu zero. It has its own sigma zero, uh, the standard deviation. So when you write out the normal density for both, just be really careful about which one you're writing about. With that, according to my claim, we're gonna have a conjugate prior, meaning that we're gonna arrive at a conjugate, or I should say, if we start with a normal prior for me, we're gonna arrive at a normal posterior for me. Okay, so that's the big picture. And we have a relatively complicated form over here, so bear with me, but we all will be able to derive it because it's nothing more than algebra exercise. Okay, 
So if you remember what we did with the beta binomial, okay, it is algebra eventually. If we don't worry about the normalizing constant, it's algebra exercise. If we keep the normalizing constant, it has some kind of calculus going on. Okay, we have to integrate out uh, the denominator and everything. But for this version, let's not worry about the normalizing constant. We can use the discrete, uh, the continuous phase rule. So what that means is my, uh, let's see, yeah. If I'm using this notation, my mu given my y1 through yn and also sigma, okay, the posterior is gonna be proportional to the prior multiplies with the likelihood. So this is the setup that I have for you. And like I said, today's lecture, part of it, a majority of it, actually a big chunk of it, is to try to do those uh, derivation exercise so we get more practice. Um, because you might be able to do that for other contexts as well, as long as you know the general procedure. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that this is the uh, continuous version of the base rule. Okay, this is how you will start doing your derivation. You have your pi mu given sigma, that's a normal. Okay, so you have to write out the density from equation eight. And then you have your likelihood function, which is, don't forget, you have a bunch of observations, y1 through yn. So this is gonna be a joint density. They're independent from each other. So recall what we did in our review lecture, how to write out the joint density. And I think we did exercise of normal. So try to recall what we did over there. And once you get your prior quantity, once you get your likelihood quantity, try to rearrange terms to figure out what would be a possible posterior distribution for me. Okay. My hint, and I will do it with you one by one, and you see the answer, the final answer is over here. My hint for you is that the prior is a function about mu. Okay. The likelihood, once you write it out, make sure to recognize it as a function of mu as well. So everything not about mu, like the y's, and also the sigma, they're constant. You don't need to worry about them, okay? You might even throw some of them into the proportional sign because everything is about mu. If it's not about mu, I don't need to worry about it. Okay, so that would be my biggest hint. Um, and another thing, as you notice over here, I use a different notation just because it will look a little bit easier to read. So instead of uh, one over sigma square, I should say, instead of sigma squared as the variance, we're using what we call precision. And we just define it to be one over sigma squared. So for, um, for phi over here, it's one over sigma squared. But if you're working with um, the sigma zero over here, we just use uh, phi zero. Okay, so this is just part of the, part of the um, hint. And um, you will see why we do that. Uh, but at this point, I think, try to write out the prior distribution using the normal density that you know and try to write out the um, likelihood part, and then try to see if you are able to recognize part of the posterior to be something that we can recognize, okay? So in case uh, those of you don't remember what the normal density looks like, so if I have a, uh, let's just say, if my x follows normal mu sigma, okay, then uh, fx is one over two pi sigma squared, the whole thing square root and then in the exponent I have negative two sigma square and then x minus mu square so that's the normal density that you need to use uh, for equation eight and nine and like I said we did some kind of review before uh, of understanding the normal and then how to write the joint density and everything so if you will check out the notes that you took before that might be useful as well uh, but at this point, I will give you uh, five minutes to get started and we will do that step by step. So we work on it a little bit. I will write out on the board of some intermediate steps and then we can go on as, uh, as we see how things go. So let me pause my recording. All right, so while everybody's still working, um, I will slowly write down, I think uh, the prior and the joint um, density, which is the likelihood. So to make sure that we are on the same page. Um, let me do that on the board one by one. Okay, so I will still keep, I think I will add the normal density uh, result, just the generic one. So if you have X follows a normal mu sigma, we know that the density of X is one over two pi sigma square. And then in the exponent negative two sigma square 
x minus mu squared. So again, I use x as a generic expression, but we're dealing with y, right, as well as um, mu and all that. Okay, so let's look at the prior first. We know that prior is a distribution about mu, okay? So we're saying that mu follows a normal distribution. I think we use mu zero and sigma zero as the uh, mean and standard deviation, okay? So the density, which I'm always using pi to represent um, the uh, prior distribution. So notice here that this is a function about mu, okay? So mu itself follows a normal with its own mean and standard deviation. So what that tells us is pi mu is two pi sigma zero squared because that's the standard deviation for mu. And then we have the, the exponent negative two sigma zero squared. And here the random variable is mu. So it's mu minus its mean mu zero squared. Okay, so if I look at my generic result, if x follows a normal, my fx is all this complicated term. And I know in my prior, we're assuming that mu follows a normal with mean mu sigma mu zero and standard deviation sigma zero. So everything is about mu and the mu is the unknown. So mu is in this place, let me use a different color. So mu is in this place, everything is about mu. And then our mu zero and mu, uh, mu zero and sigma zero just come into the place that they belong. Okay, so just pay attention to the different notations at the top. I just show you the generic normal density if the random variable is X. And if the mean is mu and sigma is the standard deviation, but in the prior, remember, we're giving normal prior for mu. So mu is the unknown. So that's why mu is in this place. And then we have mu zero, sigma zero, sigma zero everywhere. Okay. okay. So as long as you know the density function, which is this for mu, oh, sorry, for, for normal in general, and then as long as you know what the distribution you're working with for what parameter, you should be able to write out the density for, for the unknown at this point. Mm -hmm. So this might be something new, like I said, um, but really just think very carefully about what kind of um, parameter we're working with. Right now we're trying to write out the density of the prior, so it's gonna be about me. Let's look at the likelihood which hopefully is slightly easier because we have done it uh, as our review lecture and I think as one of the homework exercises. Uh, what we have is we know the normal um, IID, right? All of the observations, they are identically and independently distributed according to normal mu and sigma. Okay. So this is what we said, the density, sampling density is the data model. So in that case, we can write out the joint density y1 to yn. We know they're independent from each other. So remember, we have a big pi to show the uh, product. And then we have what? One over two pi sigma squared. And then for each of it, we have two, negative two sigma squared and then yi minus mu squared. And then the big pi goes from one to n. So this is from our review lecture. And because they are IID, they all follow the same normal distribution. So this is what we have. And we have the big product and then they share the same parts over here. Okay. But then don't forget this yi. Okay. Because here we're talking about for well, each yi, it follows a normal. So this part after the big product is the density for a particular yi. But what we're doing is for um, all of them jointly at the same time. So eventually this will become your L mu because, well, don't worry about the sigma, sigmas are the constants, like I said, because sigma, we assume we know it. So we don't need to, we don't even need to include them in our derivation. Everything is about mu. In the likelihood, it's about mu. In the prior, it's about mu. So the next step is, of course, take the product of this and this and try to solve what the posterior distribution would be for mu. So I'll give you the time to do that a little bit more. 
And uh, before I get there, I do want to um, add one more thing. So remember I said that sigma square will be really hard to work with in terms of the mathematical notation. So we define this phi to be one over sigma square. So sigma is the standard deviation. So sigma square is the variance. So one over variance is what we usually define as precision. Okay, so we can replace that everywhere. Okay, so I would just do that for, for all of us as well. So you see a sigma square over here. Okay. So what we have, um, I think it's gonna be one over two pi. And then, sorry about the small size over here. We're just gonna have, divide that by phi. Okay. And then in the exponent, you still have your mu minus mu zero square. And then over here, you have two divided by phi. Similarly over here, um, just for the bracket, like what's in this bracket, we're gonna have one over two pi divided by phi within the uh, square root, okay? And then exp negative two divided by phi, and then y i minus mu, the whole thing square. So alternatively, I'm just gonna do the demo for the next, uh, for the later one, because I have more space over here, but you can do that for the above. Uh, you can also simplify it further to be two pi. Oh, let me give us a little bit more space. So I still have my square root of two pi over here, but I'm having my, um, so this is in the denominator and it's phi divided by phi and then square root of that. So eventually I think this gives us to the power of one over two, and then you can have uh, two, you can bring the phi up if that, if you feel more comfortable doing it, but they are equivalent. Okay, so I'm just rearranging where the phi should be. So here, like I said, phi is um, divided and the square root. So we have, um, did I get it right? I think phi to the power of one over two when I do this. Over there, yeah. So it's in the denominator, we have square root of one over phi. And then now we just bring it outside of the square root and then uh, it becomes phi to the power of one over two. I think it's right. So you would do that for that as well. Just to, just eventually you'll be able to arrive at the solution that I show you. Okay, so I'll stop talking for now because I think it might be a lot of information at this point. Uh, but this is the first set of hint that I want to provide. And then the next step, like I said, is you multiply the pi mu with L mu, and then everything else except for mu is constant. So you don't need to worry about all of them. But then eventually our goal is try to recognize mu given the y1 to yn, and also sigma is another normal. Okay. And the result is in the slide itself. So I will pause and then give you more time to work on this. And of course, ask questions of anything that we already talked about, or if you get stuck at any next steps, just let me know. Yeah, I did notice I should have added zero over here. Sorry about that. It's C zero because we're talking about zero. Over here. Okay, I'm gonna give it a try on the board and you can keep working on what you're doing, of course, and we can check our work. Um, together, but I will also just talk through how I get to those steps and all that. So the pi, pi mu, as we know, is one over two pi. And then we have phi zero to the one over two, just like what we did earlier. And then we have exp. And then negative uh, mu minus mu zero square. And we have our phi zero there divided by two. Okay. So that's the prior, right? Everybody got this? Okay, good. And the likelihood, I didn't simplify as much earlier, but let's make sure that we can do that together. So I still have the big product over here. And in each of them, I have one divided by square root of two pi. I have phi, the one over two, okay? And then I have my negative two, and then I have y, i, 
minus mu squared. And don't forget your phi over there. Okay, So that's before I take the product. For each of them, this is what I have. And let's take the product before we start to do, I mean, the product of this big pi over here before we go to the Bayesian derivation. So if I take the product now, so maybe it's easier if I put the big bracket. So I'm saying that all of this need to take the product. And we did this exercise before, so hopefully not, not something too new or too strange. Uh, so first of all, we have this one over square root of two pi and phi to the power of one over two. They're a constant, right? It's not part of the product. You know, The product is about i, so it's producting over all of the y i. So essentially, the first part over here, we just raise to the power of n, because we're doing this for n times. So what that have is we have two pi, this whole thing to the power of m. Okay? And for my phi, because each, co each copy is one over two in the power. So overall I have n over two, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the exponent, because we're producting all of the exponent, but within it is gonna be a sum, okay? Just like what we did before. So uh, you can write it as two, I guess, um, let me think about, maybe the easiest way to write it so we can see the solution easier later is we're gonna have this v over two, okay? And then I just have the sum of yi minus mu, the whole thing from one to n. Okay? Okay. Yeah, so like I said, we did this exercise in, um, in the homework as well as in class. And I think we're saying that, okay, we're just gonna simplify to this stage, it's fine. We're gonna see some further simplification coming up. At this point, we get our pi mu, which is the prior. We get our likelihood, which is our L mu. And uh, now we are ready to take the product of the two and try to recognize what is the final posterior in terms of mu. So let's give it a try. And I think I will pause one more time to give you the time to, to do it by yourself. So I know my uh, posterior. So it's going to be mu given y1 through yn and sigma. It's going to be proportional to the prior and multiplies with the likelihood. Okay. And I was trying to emphasize that now everything is about mu. Mu is the unknown. So everything not about mu is a constant. You don't need to worry about it. Okay. So if I look at my two forms up here, let's see what are the constants that we don't even need to keep in our next step, okay? Because remember, we have this proportional sign. Everything is not about mu, it's a constant. They can go into the proportional sign. I don't need to worry about it, just like what we did with the beta derivation. So if you look at pi mu, I don't care about this one. I don't care about this either, but I need to care about what goes into the exponent, right? Because I have my mu over here. So I will only need to really keep this part. For my likelihood, let's focus on this line because the first one is not yet simplified. So in that case, I don't need to care about it. I don't need to care about this one either, but I do need to care about what goes into the exponent because mu is everywhere. Make sense, kind of, okay. So with that, I will do the first line for you and then let you work on a little bit more. I will still keep the proportional sign uh, because now everything is still proportional. So I have my exp, negative two mu minus mu zero square b zero. Okay. Multiply that by negative two b, and then the summation of yi minus mu square. Okay. So maybe just to keep the style consistent, I'm gonna put my b zero in front as well. So it's kind of consistent, okay? So now, as you can see, we have two exponents taking the product together. And of course we can add what's in the exponent if we want, okay? Uh, but the goal, as I said, is trying to recognize what the distribution is for mu. Okay? So there are certain things that we can further simplify, which is the next exercise for you. Is if you can look at this, you have mu, okay? That's, of course we have to keep it. But we have a mu zero over here. We are doing mu minus mu zero square. So if I expand the terms, I get what? Mu square plus mu zero square and then minus two times mu times mu zero, okay? So anything about mu zero only, you can throw it away. 
what I'm saying is a plus b squared is a squared plus b squared plus 2ab. Okay, so you will do that when you're exp expanding the square term. You would do that for this part. You would do that for that part as well. What I'm suggesting right now is once you expand the terms, you only keep any terms about mu because everything about like mu zero squared times phi zero, that's a constant. I don't need to worry about it. Similarly, when I expand this part, I get what? Yi squared plus mu squared minus two yi mu, right? So everything about mu, I still need it, but that yi squared, even though it looks complicated, we don't need to worry about it. So I will stop for now. I'll erase that part not to confuse you, but the goal here is, as you can see, we're trying to make sure that we are able to further simplify this product into something that eventually we're gonna recognize that mu is a normal distribution. So I'm gonna pause here and give you some more time to practice. And like I said, this is definitely new to pretty much everybody, um, but it is still an algebra exercise. We're not involving anything calculus here, nothing really about probability, except for the fact that we need to know the density of normal in the first place to get this derivation going. Um, but this is important to exercise, uh, just so you know that you, when you are in a new situation, I give you a new density function for the data, I give you a new prior density and ask you to derive. Um, it's all about this kind of techniques. Okay, so we did that for beta binomial before, and now we're doing it for a different context, which is the normal case. Slightly more complicated because we have y1 through yn now, we have to do the product and everything. A normal density, I think notoriously is always difficult to deal with just because it's complicated. Um, but at the end of the day, it's algebra and I'm sure everybody will be able to do it. It's just the more practice that you get, I think the better you will become. So I'm gonna give you the time to do that a little bit more now. All right, let me ask anybody made something like, I mean, make some progress and start to see something maybe close to the final answer or not yet. Not yet. Okay, maybe let. Oh, okay, Carl. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I guess something close to where there's. So I guess something like this form where you can have a plus two a b plus a minus two a b plus b square, mm -hmm. where the a is just the mean, mm -hmm. and the b is the thing that we want. So yeah. We need a constant to add the okay. negative square. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so I think I think Carl is pretty much at the last step, and um, let's maybe all get there together, and then look at how to do the next. Uh, I mean, the final step. So let me show you some stuff, and let's see, uh, and definitely point out if I start making mistakes and all that. So here, like I said, uh, oops. okay, I did something. Okay, all right. Okay. So here, um, earlier I was saying that we can uh, expand the square terms, okay? And then try to throw away anything not about mu because we don't need to worry about it, okay? So if I do this, so I'm just gonna do it step by step so I have enough space later to write out the big equations. So here I'm gonna get P zero mu squared plus mu zero squared and then minus two mu mu zero, okay? We all agree with that, okay? Yeah. So the phi zero is something multiply constant in front of it. And we have a mu square over here. So we have to keep this, okay? We have mu mu zero over here. So I have to keep that, but I can actually delete this part because I don't need to worry about phi times mu zero square. Okay, so that we agree. Okay, good. And then the other one, uh, let me try to do it up there. Um, so this is a big sum, okay? So we still have our phi multiply in front of it. And then we're gonna have our sum of y i square minus uh, plus oops, plus mu square and then minus two y i mu. Okay. And then let me keep doing that for a little bit. So the sum of square, I have the sum of y i square. Okay. The first term. So because uh, this sum is summing over the entire expansion, so I have the sum of the y i square, and then I'm gonna plus. So I'm summing up n times of mu square. So that just becomes m mu square. Okay. And then I'm uh, the, I think, 
subtracting two times the sum of yi times mu. That's my whole term. Okay. Yeah, so I'm expanding the square first and then apply the summation. The summation is outside of the square terms. Okay. But let's see what we need to keep. We don't need to worry about anything about the yi's only because they are the data, they're fixed. Okay. But m mu square and then minus two sum yi and mu, they're about mu, so we need to keep them as well. Make sense? Make sense? All right, if we're good with that, I think we're much closer to the final stuff. Okay, so let me keep writing the next step. So I have my exponent, okay? And let's just keep all we need uh, and then delete all of the other things that we don't. So from here, what do we have? We have phi zero times mu squared minus uh, two times phi zero times mu zero and then times mu. Okay. This is what we did together. Okay, I only delete the mu zero square. I don't need it. For everything else I need it, so I keep it there. And the second part over here is, uh, I still have my over two over here. And then at the top, I will have, let's see, just be really careful. I think I'm gonna have m times phi times mu square, and then minus two times phi, times the summation of yi times mu. Okay, so really, uh, like I said, it's algebra, so really just be careful. Uh, but the biggest thing, like I said, is anything not about mu is a constant, let alone whether it's yi, whether it's phi, whether it's phi zero, whether it's sigma, it doesn't matter because the prior and the likelihood, they are functions about mu. And the final posterior is a function of mu as well. So I only need to worry about the mu's. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do one more step. And I think then we'll get to where Carl was asking earlier. So because it's the product to exponent, so I can add them up. Okay, so if I start to add them up, let me first of all take out the negative one over two so I don't get confused about the summation and everything later. Within it, what did I have? I have one term, uh, two terms about mu squared and two terms about mu, okay? So I'm just gonna collect the terms. So I have phi zero plus m phi times mu squared, right? Those are the two terms about mu squared. I'm just adding them up. And then we are divide, uh, subtracting. So just the summation of whatever we need to do. So we have two times phi zero times mu zero, and then also a uh, plus, uh, two times phi times sum of yi, this whole thing multiply with mu. Mm -hmm. Wait, did you like from the last step to the recombine and then, no, I mean like recombine the exponents? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so that's what, uh, uh, let me use a different color because the product of the exponent will be the sum yeah. what's in the exponent. Okay, yeah, so let me use different colors so I can highlight what I'm adding up. So here is from this term and this term, okay? And then the second one, I have yellow. Uh, this whole term is the sum of this one and this one. Uh, the tricky thing is, of course, there are a bunch of like negative sign and here and there. So just be really careful. But something good about this, as you can see here, is that it's always going to be something mu squared minus something times mu. Okay? And that's how we started with the normal curve. And now we're seeing something very similar. We have some constant multiplied with mu squared minus some other constant times mu. Okay? And that hopefully is ringing a bell for you because this result, a plus b squared equals to a squared plus b squared times two ab, we can use it in the other way around, okay? Because I was telling you, it's gonna be a normal density. The posterior is gonna be a normal. So the posterior will have to be some kind of, so I'm gonna just write it out elsewhere and let you try to figure out the rest. So the final, whatever I need to recognize, should be in the exponent, okay? Something like one over, to um, whatever we have over here, right? And then as we know, the normal density is gonna be 
something like, let me use a different notation so I don't get confused. Um, yeah, so eventually, let me put in this one. Eventually what I need to do is I need to recognize something like this. I'm gonna use tilde to represent the final um, fee. And also I need to recognize something like this. So what I mean by this is we know eventually it's gonna be a normal density. So when it, if it's a normal density, we know that eventually it's gonna be some kind of in the exponent, uh, phi tilde, phi tilde, let's use that as the final uh, normal standard deviation, uh, uh, precision divided by two times mu minus mu tilde, which is something you try to solve the whole thing squared. So of course, the question now becomes how to get this phi tilde and how to get this mu tilde. And what I'm saying is, if we all agree at this step, then the final step is trying to match how we can get that phi tilde and how we can get that mu tilde. So I'm gonna uh, pause here one more time and I will uh, put people back to the breakout room. So hopefully the last step is almost there for everyone and then we're gonna look at it together all right anybody kind of got the final answer or very close i'm still not sure okay so let's look at it together and um what we have over here is we have some kind of constant multiplying in front of mu, mu squared okay and it's minus two times some other constant when I say constant, they're all known because you know the y's, you know what the prior are giving, what is mu zero, what is sigma zero and everything. So we have something multiplied with mu squared minus two times something times mu. And we're trying to complete the squares. Eventually we can recognize it to be something like this form. Okay? So this form is a normal in the end. So if we're able to recognize what we have over there, we'll be able to recognize the mu and the standard deviation. Um, so just because of the space, I'm just gonna say that this whole thing is A and this whole thing is 2B, okay? So I have a constant B over there that I can work with a little bit easier, okay? So what do we have? That translates to EXP, negative two, one over two, A mu squared minus two B mu, right? If I assume phi plus m phi is a, and then two phi zero mu zero plus two phi sum of y i is two b, then this is what I have. And our goal is what I have on the left hand side. So let's see what we can do a little bit more. Okay. So we want to have mu minus mu tilde square, and we have an a in front of it. So if I get the a out, I'm going to have. Um, Let's see, a over two, okay? If I just put the a out, I get o over two. And then over here, I have mu squared minus two b divided by a mu. Right, all I'm trying to do is I try not to have any constant in front of mu anymore. I just have a, a mu square anymore. So I'll be able to complete the squares easier a little bit later. Okay? So if I have, again, negative one over two times a mu squared minus two b mu, I just need to get the a as a constant outside. So I start to have negative a over two times mu squared minus two b divided by a mu. Okay. And now if I try to complete the square, I can have exp negative, so a over two, let's just stay over there. We don't need to worry about it. If I try to complete the squares over here, I really have mu minus b over a squared. So if I look at the final thing that I have, mu minus b over a squared, what do I have if I expand the terms? I have mu squared plus b squared over a squared, and then minus two times b over a mu. Right. This is using this result backwards. Okay. And you notice that, well, what about the extra b squared over a squared thing that I 
that I need to worry about. I don't because it is a constant, so I can just add as much as I want. Okay, I'm gonna say one more time about the last step. So I know because the notate, I don't have too much space, so I have to use A and B as proxy. But in fact, when you're doing this derivation, when the terms becomes too complicated, it's not a bit bad idea to use some kind of proxy so you don't get confused yourself. So we start with, in the exponent, negative one over two, A times mu squared minus two B mu. That's all we start with, okay? And the goal is try to recognize it as a normal density. Eventually something like what I circled at the left over here. So if I try to complete the squares, all I need to do is I need to put no constant in front of mu squared. So I have sometimes like mu squared plus or minus something about mu. So if I want to do that, because I have an A multiplied with mu squared first, I just bring it outside of the, uh, uh, I guess, parentheses over here. So I have A multiplying in front of it. So A over two. And then in my parentheses, I have mu squared minus, just to make sure that I have the terms right. I just need to do 2b divided by a mu. Okay. And this is, well, if I try to complete the squares over there, this whole thing divided by two is my last constant. Okay. So that is my mean. So if you look at the final answer over here, which we're gonna go back to the slides in a second, this will be my new b, and this will be my new me. Okay. So as soon as you see something like this, we can say that this time mu follows a normal distribution with mean b over a, whatever that is, we have to go back to to make it work. And then a is the precision for the posterior distribution. Okay. So it's a lot of information and it's new to pretty much everybody. So I would say, um, Maybe instead of watching the video, if you don't want to, the textbook has a good section of how to do the derivation, not as detailed as what we do in class, but definitely different lines to a certain degree. So you can try to follow again. But like I said, even though it's complicated, it's really just a bunch of algebra. And it's really just getting practice with how to deal with normal density in different contexts. And sometimes um, we need to expand the terms. Sometimes we have to complete the squares and all that. And as you do more, I think this will become more um, straightforward and natural. So with that, I'm gonna clear everything over here and then come back to our slide, okay? So of course the A and B, I'm not able to <laughs> define it anymore, uh, but this was our B over A earlier, okay? And this is our, um, so remember, uh, whatever A is the precision and here we're using standard deviation. So it's gonna be one over whatever the A and B that we defined earlier. Okay. All right, so with that, I just want to take one more moment um, to look at the results a little bit um, so that we can get some intuition. So you know that, and you can see that sometimes the derivation can be pretty heavy, uh, but at the end of the day, we're trying to uh, make sure that whatever we have done first of all is correct. And also it can give us some insight about how Bayesian inference is being done. So what I want us to, to look at, I think at this point, let's see, yeah, is to look at the mean a little bit. Okay. So this is the posterior mean because whatever the mean parameter is the posterior. So let's take a look at what is really saying. It has this phi zero times mu zero. So this are from the prior, mu zero is the prior mean, okay? And it also has another component of n times phi times y bar. So this n times y bar, by the way, is whatever we have er earlier is the sum of the yi, because the sum of the yi is the same as n times the average. So that's another way to just simplify it. So what I want to highlight is that the posterior mean, as we see it over here, in the denominator, we have this phi zero plus n phi. So this is coming from the prior, this is coming from the, uh, the data, okay? And then in the top, we have, phi zero times mu zero, mu zero is the prior mean, and we have n phi times y bar, y bar is the sample mean. Okay. So what we see over here is that we have a weighted average. So this is just like what we're talking about in the beta binomial case, but a little bit easier to see over here because for normal, uh, whatever the normal mean is the mean of what we're working with. So the posterior mean 
is the weighted average of the prior mean and the sample mean. And when we say the weighted average, the weight for the prior is this phi zero, and the weight for the data is the m phi. Okay, so I'm gonna say that again. What we have seen over here is this is the posterior prior posterior mean of the norm of the mu. It is a weighted average of the prior mean and the sample mean. And the weights themselves are also related to the prior and the data model. So I know in homework two, hopefully some of you started doing that already, I gave you uh, the exercise of recognizing uh, for the beta prior and posterior, I asked you to recognize how to see it as a weighted average of the prior mean and the sample mean. So that is another exercise. Here we can see that as well. It is a weighted average of the prior mean and the sample mean for the normal as well. So with that, I just want to show you, uh, well, remember, P0 is known, mu0 is known, all of this is known, all of this are known as well. So this are known as well. When I say known is y bar, you know from the data, it's given to you, right? And you know n times y bar. And we already said that phi, you remember, is one over sigma square. So I assume, we assume that sigma is known in our model. So you know what the phi value is. And then once you decide what kind of prior you're gonna use for nor or for mu, you also know phi zero and mu zero. So what this means is that, just like what we're talking about conjugate prior, I already know exactly what the normal prior a posterior distribution gonna be because I know all of the values once I have the data, once I have what the prior I'm gonna use. So we can always use the R norm function, just like what we did with our beta in the beta binomial example. We can use the R norm functions to sample a large number of draws of mu from this equation 10. And if I'm ever interested in doing Bayesian inference, such as hypothesis tests, such as a credible interval and doing predictions and all that, this follows through pretty nicely as what we did before. Okay, so if you remember what we were talking about last week, how can we do Bayesian inference once we know what the analytic distribution of the posterior is gonna be? For that, if you remember, we have a beta A plus Y and then M or B plus M minus Y, right? That was all we need to get the beta posterior. So we use R beta to generate a large number of draws. And then from there, we can summarize the posterior in various ways. So if we're dealing with the normal, uh, the equation is a little bit more complicated, but it's given once you finish the derivation, if it convinces yourself this is true, this is a known result that anyone can use. Okay? And when that happens, uh, you will be able to do posterior inference for this mu um, as well. Okay? So the biggest takeaway, I guess, is after, well, we did a lot of time in class, I know, um, talking, about the co uh, talking about the derivation and all that, but at the end of the day, this is the most important results. I still highly recommend you to go through yourself how we arrived at. Um, but after that is done, this is the posterior distribution for mu. And then this is the thing that you can work with afterwards. So I included some code, which you can play with because I posted the code on Moodle as well. Um, so here I'm showing you some kind of prior choices I can have, okay? And then y bar is just the average of the um, observations themselves. And I also fix a particular fee for us so that we know what the sigma is. And then all you need to do is to calculate that mu and standard deviation, which is, let me go back to the previous slide, is this two quantities that I highlight over here. So you can write a function. It's really just one line actually. And you put it in as your mu n and SDN. And then you can, like what we used to do, Monte Carlo simulation, you set how many draws you wanna do. You use the R norm, so you're doing a thousand times, and the mean is whatever the posterior mean that you got, and the standard deviation is the posterior standard deviation you get, and then you can do plotting and everything about it. So I think I have a def, uh, yeah, I have an illustration of um, the posterior density. So you can see that I centered something around, oops, center something around 8.74, maybe, yeah. And I think the mu, um, yeah, I think mu zero, sorry, mu zero is five, I guess. I don't know the y bar um, on the top of my head, but it's calculated once you get the data. Um, so this is the final posterior density of this mu. 
And if you want to do confidence intervals, you know, if you want to do anything else, hypothesis test and everything, once you have those draws, you can do what we had done before for the beta um, to continue for the next step. Okay, so today's lecture, as you can see, very heavy on the derivation. And this is probably uh, the last or the second last one that we're going to do as much detail as in class. But like I said, uh, the references in the textbook, we have sections about how to do this derivation, not as detailed as what we did in class, but definitely still give you overall direction. So I would highly recommend you check it out. So on Friday, um, we will finish this part of the lecture. I will also mention it about lab two. So lab two is going to be everything about doing the normal. Okay. So it's going to be all of the Bayesian inference you can do about normal. We're going to spend some time on that. I will also talk about another conjugate model and multicolored simulation in general, so you will get a better understanding and uh, apprehension. Okay. All right. That's all for today. And I'll see you all on Friday.